morning. Good morning. I think we're there. We're, we're working. Welcome to the hospitality hotline. My name is Catherine. This is week two of our coronavirus edition of the hotline. Things are looking a little different, but I'm so glad you're here. And it's important to me to continue to show up here and just um, share with you what's going on in the world of hospitality and check in with you a little bit. So I wanted to start by saying, I'm hearing a word over and over. <clears throat> you might be hearing it too. If you listen to it, I bet you'll hear it. Um, I'm hearing a lot of people use the word settling, like I'm settling in. When I ask people how they are, we're settling in, we're finding a rhythm. And I think that's bringing um, two things simultaneously. I think it's bringing a sense of normalcy, even though normal is now different. But I also think it's bringing a sense of uh, grief and sadness at the things that are being lost or skipped over or missed and given up. And I think both of those things, <laughs> both of those things are okay. And together they're really confusing, but I am hearing a lot of the words settling in. I feel that myself. Um, I feel like the last two weeks I was in a triage situation where I was trying to figure out what needed the most attention and how to give it that attention. And we were making decisions um, by the hour. It felt like both at home and at work. And that is no longer the case. We are definitely settled in and a little bit sad at what's being lost. So today, there's not a topic I want to share with you. I have a list of things all week. I've just been jotting down. Oh, I want to talk about that. So I have a list of about seven different quick hit topics that I want to say and talk about. And the first is I want to check in with you. Last week, I shared the routine builder with you. <clears throat> it was really fun to see online how some of you um, are using this and partnering with your pandemic partner to figure out what you need and figuring out the steps you need to take to make that happen. I love it, keep it up. I wanna tell you personally what I have discovered in the last week using the Routine Builder. First of all, it was really helpful for me to have a tangible tool to get it out of my head, onto the page, <clears throat> and to have some sort of framework to begin to think about what I needed. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is not meant to be um, ironclad. This is meant to support you. And what I discovered over the past week since I shared this with you was that I have the capacity to continually do over and over daily about two things in the morning, two things during the context of my work day, and maybe one or two in the evening time. And it's important to me that as I fill in my weekly routine builder, that I am realistic about what I can actually consistently do. Because here, here's something true. If you fill this up with things that you cannot consistently achieve, now this has just become like a bully and it's gonna have the opposite effect. This is meant to build positive traction for you. So I have been, I've been very gentle with the expectations that I'm setting for myself. Um, and that has felt good because I can consistently show up and do these couple of things and I can do them every day. It doesn't matter if I can come up with a list of 16 things. If I can't sustain 16 things, it's not serving me. So the question I wanna maybe add and layer on is what are the number of things that you can consistently commit to day over day over day over day? So just as an example, uh, the things that I was able to consistently commit to the past week, in the morning, I'm back to drinking my green smoothie every morning. I make it happen, I don't think about it, I just do it, I know I need it, I hate that feeling of getting to work or getting to the middle of the morning and realizing I'm starving and then not having a great option. And so like, the smoothie's happening. That is really foundational. Um, the other thing I'm doing every morning is my coffee journal routine because, uh, it's methodical, it helps me process emotions, and it's quiet alone time, so it's hitting a lot of high, high need things for me. At work, I'm drinking all the water, all the time. Anytime I'm like bored, distracted, hungry, not sure what to do, I, I drink water. Like while I'm waiting to figure it out, like just guzzle the water. Can you drink more water? Go drink more water. Um, and that is, that's something I'm doing at work. And then at night, I'm committed 
I'm committed to washing my face every night. I just am. It feels good. It's easier to not do it, but we all know that feeling and it's just, it's something I'm committed to doing every night. And so those are my, those are, those are my baseline things that I'm hitting. So <clears throat> I'm going to be filling out my routine builder again for next week. Maybe layering on more, but maybe not. Maybe I need, I don't know, but I just wanted to check in with you. I told you I would, and I want to let you know, I wrote this down so I could remind myself. The reason a routine matters in a time of stress, particularly a time of stress where nothing is normal and our normal things are gone, is that <clears throat> our, our bodies are looking for ways that, this sounds crazy, but our bodies are looking for ways that they can trust us. In times of high stress, our nervous system is not sure what's gonna happen, so it tenses up and goes into all the, you know, fight or flight coping mechanisms. And it's looking to us to provide ways to build trust. Is she gonna give us what we need? Can we count on it consistently? And when the things that we normally have as consistent things in our life are gone, it's up to us to start to provide these new grooves and rhythms. So I want you to think about it like this. If you were to take a paring knife to your kitchen table or your dining room table and scratch it, you might be able to see like a faint line. It's there. If you were to go back every day and scratch that same line with a sharp knife, little by little, that groove would get bigger and then it would turn into a gash and then you would definitely be able to see it. You would definitely be able to feel it. And then it would get to the point where like anybody across the room could start to see it. That's what we're doing right now with the routine. You are laying down new grooves, new patterns. And the only way that happens, it's not like make a scratch here, make a scratch there, skip a few days, like same thing over and over. Your body starts to latch onto that. Your mind starts to expect the routine. And these are the kinds of patterns that help sustain in times of stress. Routines are not meant for the good times. We build routines hopefully during good times so that when things get really hard, um, our routines can carry us well through the stress. So that's my two cents on routines. I hope they are serving you well. <clears throat> Number two, I had this thought the other night that brought me so much joy, I have to share it. You may not relate, but if you relate, I hope this brightens your day. Do you know what quarantining has done for me? It has obliterated my lice-related anxiety. If you have children who have ever had lice, and I do, I'm sorry if that bothers you, um, we have had lice a couple of times in my parenting journey and even when we don't have it, there is always this little thing in the back of my mind when I'm close to my children that says, can you see anything crawling? Do they have any eggs? How's it looking under there? Like it's just always there. I don't know that it will ever go away. Maybe when they're adults, I have a constant, very low line <laughs> lice awareness in my children. It's gone. Like hasn't even occurred to me. I would head hug all of them because they do not have lice. They're not, they're not seeing anyone else and quarantining has done wonders for the lice anxiety. Please let me know if you relate so I don't feel alone in that. Number three, <clears throat> speaking, speaking of anxiety, I wanted to share something with you that I've been doing that I'm calling a reset walk. This is not a workout. This is not an exercise. It's a way to, if you're in the middle of something that feels, if you're, if you're feeling anxiety, I've been talking to some friends. I was on a call last night and we were all comparing notes on, we are from time to time physically feeling symptoms of like crushing anxiety. Like you can, phys it's not just like I'm preoccupied in my mind. It's like my, my, my heart is pounding. My breathing is shallow. My hands might be shaking that kind of anxiety ridden physical manifestations. I want to share with you something that I've been doing. I decided to call a reset walk. You don't have to like change clothes. You don't need to get into workout clothes, like whatever. Go outside and start walking. Now for me, I have to, I have to listen to something so that my mind has something to focus on. So I will either put on a podcast, I will put on an audible book so that my brain is like listening to the words and it's kind of occupied with that. It's like giving a, a toy to a toddler so that you can get some work done somewhere else. I give my brain something to listen to. Great. I start walking and I find a pace at which my breathing follows 
my steps in a pattern of four. So in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. And that determines the pace that I walk. And I find the pace and I start breathing in through my nose, three, four, out through my mouth, three, four. You do this for 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. Two things are happening. That's how long it takes for our nervous systems to kind of reset and come down off that anxiety high. Yes, exercise in general is wonderful for anxiety and things like that, but it is a way to reset kind of what's going on in your body. It's not gonna necessarily eliminate it all, but it definitely will give you kind of a pause and a reset. I had to do this yesterday afternoon. It was 20 minutes, I came back. Nothing was solved, but I did feel a little bit better. So just a tangible action item for you. The hardest part of that whole thing is getting yourself up and walking out the door. Hands down, that's the trickiest part. Okay, I wanna tell you number four. This is so great. This is the best part of my week. Let me cover up the identifying information. The other day at work, I received a card in the mail. If you've been following me since, gosh, I can't remember. When was the, when was the bad card? Yeah, I guess it was around, yeah, it was around the holidays. I got a different kind of card in the mail. This is not that. So I got a card in the mail. I thought, oh my gosh, fun. Cute little envelope. Opened it up. Cute little card. Who is this from? Opened it up, started reading. Y'all, this is a handwritten note from someone that I only know virtually. We're not, um, like, we don't live in the same city. We only know each other virtually. She just took the time to write a note to say, hey, thank you. Thank you're doing great. Love, love to see you. Thank you for your work. Um, supporting you from afar. Hope you're well. Give your team a pat on the back. Let me know when you're coming to my city. Um, best part of my week. And here's why. The words were amazing. So kind. It's always good to hear kind words from other people. The trouble, such a thoughtful gesture. I did not realize till I was holding this card in my hand and going through the physical action of opening it and pulling it out and looking at words that another human, like I'm holding this in my hand. Everything else in my life right now is virtual. Every sense of connection is virtual. It's either a text message or a Zoom call or a phone call or a DM or a post or something. And those are great. Those are great. I can touch this and it felt, it felt so good. I wanted to like wrap it up and just hold it the rest of the day. And it got me thinking, this is not, this is not difficult. We can do this. If you have someone that you love that lives in a different city or maybe in the same city, my gosh, in the same city, wouldn't it be great to send them a card? I mean, just the tangible act of going to the mailbox and pulling something out that someone wrote to you, this is a gift and it costs, I don't even know what a stamp costs these days, but not much, not a big deal. Also, your kids can do this. Have them start writing letters to their friends, little cards, drawings, like it's an activity, it's a way to tangibly show love and this was one of the best parts of my week. So thank you to my new friend. She knows who she is, I've already thanked her um, in person. Um, I just wanted to share that with you because it it changed my, changed my week. Okay, I also wanna tell you the best thing I cooked this week, which I did take a little phone video of and I will turn into an Insta story. I'll try to get that up tonight because you've gotta make them. Um, from the Ina Project, Ina's Roasted Salmon Tacos. I cannot like make them. Unless you don't like salmon, you won't like them, but you've got to make them. Um, I made them, Elizabeth made them. I want, I want you to make them. My kids love them. My husband loved them, like so good. So best thing I cooked this week were the roasted salmon tacos. I will, I'm pretty sure you can Google that recipe, Anna Garten roasted salmon tacos and find it. I will also post the Instagram story, hopefully tonight. We'll see how that goes. Um, speaking, <clears throat> speaking of cooking, Let's talk about some cathartic cooking resources. I have heard from a couple of friends that they are finding, and maybe, maybe you're finding this too, that the going through the process of cooking right now feels completely different than it did back when our lives were normal. 
and there's a certain kind of relaxed sense of time. Nobody's in that big of a rush to do anything. There are no outside pressures. So you can just sort of take your time and not let it bother you and do those long projects in the kitchen and do the dishes slowly and just sort of leisurely go through it. And that is another form of routine. That is another thing that we can get in the habit of doing that will help carry us through times of stress. And so I thought it might be good um, to talk about some options for you. There are several, not very many, but several things saved in my story highlights on my profile. <clears throat> There's the chicken stock and the onion dip. Um, there are brownies. You could make them all four different ways. There are, um, remember way back when I did omelets? That's a fun project. There's the roast chicken. I mean, between that and the recipes on my blog, I would love for you to like choose something and just get in the kitchen and let the stress of it like disappear because there's nothing at stake. This is very easy, but it's something cathartic that you can do. It occupies your mind and your hands, and I personally am finding great comfort in that. I also want to remind you, and I shared something about this earlier this week here, that now more than ever, I am finding intense, um, a sense of nourishment almost, uh, not for my body necessarily, although that is a part of it, but kind of for my heart in recooking things that I know I've I've enjoyed in the past. It's not, it's not just about the food. It's kind of about recalling the memory associated with that recipe. And if you don't, if you have that sense in your life, now's the time to pull out those favorites and share them again with your family. If you don't have that as a as a touch point in your life, oh my gosh, now is the time. Now is the time to make something create a memory eating it with someone else and then make it again in a couple of weeks and this will become for example um, the chocolate cake the corona cake that I shared that you guys have been making all the time it's so fun it's easy it's made with a cake mix and a few other ingredients so whether you realize it or not those of you that have made that during this time you are you're depositing something that will yield a return down the road <clears throat> Not only do you know, now know how to make that delicious cake, but there's a memory associated with that. And every time you make that Corona cake, you and whoever else is living in your home is going to remember the Corona cake and all that was going on right now. That's what you're going to recall. So consider this the time to kind of like build a little garden of food memories that are gonna to continue to blossom and grow. And at some point in the future, you're gonna turn around and look back on this season and it's gonna be like, oh yeah, that was the macaroni and cheese recipe. We ate it once a week, it was so good. Do you guys remember? We were in our pajamas all day, uh, and we were going crazy. That's what you can do now. I know it seems like uh, it doesn't matter, whatever. It matters immensely, particularly if you have children at home. This time is getting burned into their brain. This, this is part of their childhood that they're gonna be talking about 20 years from now. We'll all be talking about this 20 years from now, but this isn't part of my childhood. I'm a middle-aged adult woman. I've had a childhood. My kids, the things that I'm doing, the things that we're doing during this time are deposits into their childhood story. And I'm telling you, the power of food to be an agent for memory right now is huge. Do not underestimate that. Even if it's something like packaged Oreos every night, it doesn't have to be homemade. But what I'm telling you is you have an opportunity to deposit memories into your children's brains that are built around things they taste. Don't miss this opportunity. Okay, enough about that. Um, last thing, number seven because this is the hospitality hotline, because I can't pass up an opportunity to beat this drum, I wanna remind you that hospitality is for now. If you're thinking that hospitality is something that we're gonna get back to one day when quarantining is over and things are normal, I wanna tell you that is not the nature of hospitality. Hospitality is for now. It is not obsolete just because we're living in a tricky time. It's not obsolete just because we can't gather with others. It is for now. Uh, I want to encourage you to engage your heart more than ever. I want you to look at your motives 
as you serve your family, as you live in close proximity with those inside your home, as you have opportunity to reach out to others in tangible ways to express love, as you connect with others virtually, I want you to consider a heart of hospitality, which is centered on expressing love, anticipating need, and connecting with others. This is hospitality. If anything, this season that we're in is stripping away the parts of hospitality that are fun. And listen, I'm here for the fun parts. But the, the nugget of truth behind the heart of hospitality is more easily displayed today than it has ever been in the time, that I, time frame that I can remember. This is the time to engage in true hospitality. This is the time to know what's behind the flower arrangements and the table settings and the parties and thinking through all the details. What's behind all those things has not changed. It's never gonna change. So this is the time to engage in it. Um, on that note, enrollment to the table is open. I opened it yesterday. If you don't know what the table is, it's my membership site where we engage in hospitality. I give you tools and content centered around this topic. It's really great. If you're interested, there are ways you can find out more. Um, but I hope, I hope that as you go forward this week, you remember your routine and what it's about. You look for ways to reach out to others. I would suggest writing a couple of letters this week. Um, that you stop worrying about the lice, that you take a reset walk if you need to, and um, that you continue to engage in loving others well, however that looks for you. Thank you so much for being here this week. Can't wait to see you next week.